Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? Actually, it's only existentialism if it comes from the existentialism region from France. Otherwise, it's just sparkling anxiety. Or nihilism. Nihilism, yeah. It's all good. Other than well, that, oh, damn it. I just realized I left my drink in the kitchen. Oh, well, dry mouth it is. No, I'll let you go upstairs. No, nah, I can do without. I got I got some WD-40 behind me. I can do you know, Oh, well, okay, sh- that'll work. I'll keep moving. <sighs> How are okay. you doing? I am awake. Body. You're what? I am awake. Oh, I thought you said you were late. No, I'm awake. Oh. I'm up. I'm mobile. Uh, what is the? What is it? My grandfather always used to say, uh, "Every day above ground is a good day." I'm this side of the daisies. Yes, we are the worms under the pavement, and we hear a squish. We look to see where cousin Dave went. Oh, I better quit before we get sued. Now I gotta say something. It's been a really weird last couple months for the podcast. Yes, it is. Usually, Corey and I, we sit down, we talk about what we want to talk about. But events kind of superseded what we had planned to talk about. Some of them unpleasant, the passing of various comic creators, the crazy distributor war stuff going on. Which is still going on. Yeah. Then, you know, we had our, our trip to Duluth. We had free the comic book show, day. Free comic book day, the preview shows, which we try to make timely, not oh yeah, those orders were due last week. Sorry, I can't get you for you now. You know, Brian complaining about I don't collect pops. You know, it was it was stressful. People falling asleep, leaving me alone for four hours. Oh, I was not alone. I was in a room full of comic books, so I was good. But I have a bunch of things that things that I had wanted to cover. And they're not all groundbreaking things, but just things I thought would be fun. Most of it can be put under the category of things I discovered while I was doing other things. Odds and ends. Odds and ends. There we go. Do we have any theme music for it? No. We don't have a theme music budget. And of course, even as I You know, I, I was looking back on some of our very early episodes, and I can count at least three people who said that they would write little uh, music bits for us. Oh, I, yeah. I'm still friends with them, but they don't do music anymore. Oh. So the sad well, thing I, is uh, that if they would have done it way back then, uh, it maybe, maybe they would have become huge stars. And I've also talked to my cousin, uh, Dave Anderson. He's He plays with the Atlantic Rhythm section. He His wife does theme songs. And I've actually talked to them about doing something, but... Never really did anything about it because, you know, COVID hit and, you know, just all sorts of weird things. And remember, there was a time we did try to change our theme song. And, yeah, we don't get a lot of feedback because most podcasts do not. No. That was the one time we got an avalanche of five emails within an hour saying, you don't do that. Don't do that. So that's, you know. So we're a little, we're not good with change. We would rather just do it slowly. Like, you know, we don't, we don't do tales from the home as much. We don't do tales from the shop, mainly because we've kind of tailed ourselves out. So, and I don't even want to talk about how long ago it was that you closed your shop, but uh, if, if your shop, if a child was born the day your shop closed, they would be buying weed. Well, Dana is 30. She was born the first day of the shop. She's actually graduating from grad school next year. Wow. Yeah, I'm I am so, so impressed with her. So uh, that said, here's a couple of the the weird things that I've run across and things I wanted to talk about. And we'll talk about them now. I mentioned. Yeah, I have a problem. I like to geek a lot. And I went down to. Rochester a while back to 
uh, well, just, you know, deliver flyers and do some geeking and stuff like that. What I d- one of the things I mentioned is I stopped in Hastings because there's a number of stores in Hastings and it was on Juneteenth or one of the Juneteenth celebrations. And OK, good thing you can edit. I'm not going to think I'd make this easy on you, did you? Basically, before a podcast, I line up a dozen windows so I can talk about things. But then as I'm getting ready to talk about it, they close on me. We had talked about this before. It's a book called Hate Stings, a comic book. And I'm going to open it up and see if I can get the creative team. Yeah, was this a book about the people who hate? All of the uh, people who dressed up as a fake Sting in WCW in the 90s? No, and it's not about Sting and, and the hatred of the police either. Oh. This is actually a little bit based on local history. I'll just read on the back of the comic. In the years prior to the emancipation, while the Civil War still raged, a few enslaved black men and women seized freedom for themselves, regardless of how the law was stated and at risk to their own lives. Hate Stings reveals for the first time those untold histories based on true events of the Reconstruction era, Black Minnesotans, highlighting the resilience in the face of racial terror. Writer and descendant James Curry weaves together fact-based narratives of the overall Wallace and Curry families into an unforgettable story of extraordinary circumstances encountered by these real-life heroes and heroines, the triumph and the tragedy of their lives and the spirit shown despite the powerful forces and odds opposing them. It's the first issue of Hate Stings. It's a genre series that covers the earliest decades of that re- those remarkable histories and more. Beautifully illustrated by legendary artist Tom Wing and lettered, edited by Keith Champagne of Marvel DC Comics fame. When I went down there, I actually met up with the guys because they had the comic. I got copies, I got it autographed. And I actually got a little bit of an interview with them. It was a windy summer day, so forgive the lot of... <laughs> but here it is. All right, guys, I'm down in Hastings, Minnesota. It's comic book launch day for Hate Stings. It's a book about what we're going to do is uh, interview the creators of the book. For Podcast Land, who wants to uh, state your name and who you are? I'll do it. All right. James Curry, writer of Hastings. All right. Keith Champagne, Swiss Army Knife of Hastings. <laughs> All right. Tom Nguyen slash Wynn slash Nelson slash Nugent. Not a slash. Artist Nugent. of Hastings. Nice. I like that. <laughs> so what did is... you draw Superman? <laughs> he does all sorts of stuff. So what is Hastings about for someone who's like, well, Sure. Never it, heard about it. It's an, uh, a snapshot of the origin stories of some of Hastings uh, Black Pioneers. That's Hastings, Minnesota. And um, a bit of a tease for a larger uh, expanded graphic novella. So is this uh, obviously the... Uh, I've, I've talked about this on the podcast before because of last time I got a little flyer and talked about it. Sure. But now the comic's out. So where would somebody be able to find the comic? So Tom's got a page that he's going to set up on Monday, uh, point of sale. Um, I'll, we'll get back to you with that actual page okay, address. Yeah, that works. Otherwise, it will be on my official website. Cool. Yeah. Otherwise, Mind's Eye in Burnsville, and um, the source, as well as Most Wanted Comics in Bloomington. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, we'll and at some point, various historical societies are signed on to pick it up. Fantastic. There's a pretty good lineup here. I mean, we've got about 15 people in line. I lucked out getting here <laughs> before hear. everybody else. And there's food. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's kind of in celebration of Juneteenth. Not kind of. I mean, it was just fortuitous, really. Yeah, and a beautiful day, too. Totally. A lot of folk, a lot of black folks came right up here on this river. Uh, as a port from the, uh, whether it's Underground Railroad or just uh, free slaves. So Keith, you got anything to add? Um, I feel grateful that I was brought in to help out finish this book and drag it over the finish line. Cool. And man. I'm looking forward to being involved in the next chapters of the project. I think it's an important project. I think people can learn a lot by reading it. It's also sure. a really entertaining comic nice. book. 
Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading the book. It's worth it. Tom, how about you? Anything to add? Oh, I'm just grateful to be a part of this. I, I think it's a, a really po- important step into uh, showcasing an, a different part of history that uh, in story uh, that that people so um, well, they either don't know it, they're not taught it. Yeah, they're, they're not taught it. You know, and, and the great thing about it is that you know the writer is a, an actual descendant, you know, of the story itself. So you're you're getting a, a legitimate source of authenticity with the story. Yeah. Cool. cool. So is there anything else anybody wants to plug? Books, graphic novels. Uh, so Big Brother. Big oh, Brother yeah. season twenty five. Oh gosh, good enough. And TMZ. Oh. TMZ, who the heck is that? Or who the bleep is that? I think um, Weird Al Yankovic did a song about them, didn't they? I don't know. Oh, uh, thank you. TMZ. Oh, did they? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah talking about that. how they're yeah. yeah. always ruining things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and also, uh, one last thing is the Switch sequel. The Switch, which is Keith and, and my creator own book, superhero book. Uh, the first one came out a few years ago and we're ready to put out a book two. So, this year. Who's publishing? Self published? We're going to self publish. Well, New Pain is our publishing okay. company. So. All right. And I will definitely, when I see your post, we're going to drop this in a week or so. So, I'll definitely put the website up. Again, Hate Stings, self published, looking great. And I'll probably have a review of it by the time the podcast hits. Thanks a lot, guys. That's it. Bonus. The book is now available at better comic book shops, including I've seen it at The Source. I've seen it at Mind's Eye. And I'm just looking to see, because it's to be continued, br4r.org, Building Remembrance for Recollections. So, again, that's br4r.org. And I'm sure if you if you contacted James, Tom, or Keith, they would probably be able to hook you up with the book if if you couldn't. It's a beautiful book. I have not read it yet, but I was very excited to get it. I was very excited to get them. And thank you for taking time to talk to me. And, and there I will hope- be a link in the show notes. Yes. Hopefully it's it's great. Sorry, I'm trying to get the next thing up. Uh, we've talked before about my friend Jeff. He does a podcast called Cinema Judge. And he took us up on our our offer. Corey, tell tell everybody about the offer for friends of us that have podcasts, YouTube channels, whatever. If you have a creative endeavor, book, comic, podcast, YouTube channel, you, you sell crocheted vests from 1970. If you do macrame plant holders, send us an ad, an audio ad, and we will run it for free. And the reason I do this the Daily Rios, which is run by Peter Rios, who was one of the original comic geeks of Comic Geek Speak on his podcast, runs promos for other comic podcasts. And I figure it is a cool way for us to give back and get you in front of 4,000 people. Joe, how much does this cost? Absolutely nothing. It's that is free. right. I so, mentioned uh, that because... Our friend Jeff from Cinema Judge. Well, let's have let's listen what Cinema Judge is in his own words. Hello, movie lovers. Jeff here from the podcast Cinema Judge. The studios they provide us with movie clips, interviews, on the set footage, and so much more. We present you, the jury, with the evidence, and you make up your own mind if you want to see the movie or not. So join me as we take a deep dive into some hidden gems you may have never heard of or more insights in the movies you already love. So if you're interested in movies, you can find me on most platforms, Cinema Judge, Spotify, Apple, you name it. I look forward to seeing you in the courtroom. Thanks, Joe and Corey, for making this possible. That said, you can head to his podcast like us. He does not put anything behind a firewall. Everything's free. He just put up something on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. He has podcasts on the Elementals, the Blackening, Transformers, Rise of the Beast. And he did something very impressive. He interviewed actor Jesse Cole and had him, I guess, more live, you know, not not podcast, but like video interviewed. Jesse Cole is an actor, most notably from Cobra Kai. And of course, I believe his his oh, who's a bad guy in Cobra Kai? 
Uh, uh, well, well, that Martin, Martin Cole. Martin Cole, his dad. I think it's his dad. Could could be his uncle. I, I don't remember. Anyways, Jeff records and had a wonderful interview with him. And Jeff is so humble, so apologetic because he's like, it's my first time doing it. He wasn't sure how to work the controls, but it was a wonderful interview. Jesse was a great interview. Of course, it was done pre-strike. So again, all this stuff that Jeff does, he'll continue to do stuff because he's not doing it for money. He's doing it because he loves movies. Oh my gosh, you get Jeff going on movies. He's just phenomenal to talk. And believe me, I, I've tried to get him on our podcast, but he's just, he's too humble. He's too too worried about making himself look dumb. And I'm like, dude, no, you trust me. I could just sit back and listen to you and Corey talk. Cause it's like when, when Butch and you talk wrestling, I have to say a thing for the next 50 miles. <laughs> so check it out. Tell him you heard it here and just enjoy it because I think it's a lot of fun. Speaking, I, we, we don't do a lot of things talking about upcoming shows because what happens is because of all the, the weird scheduling, I'll talk about it maybe after I'm there. But if if you want to know, I mean, you know there's a spring con coming up in, or fall con in October because Pat and I are going to it. Pat and Joel, right again. Woohoo! But I did want to mention a couple of things. One of the shops Corey and I stopped at was the Gaming Den in Cambridge, Minnesota. Beautiful shop. Oh, my gosh. Laid out. So gorgeously, comics on one side, games on the other, a gaming room. The young lady who was there was very kind because Corey and I showed up late. And we were like, well, you know, if you need to kick us out, it's good. no, as long as the gamers are going, we'll we'll keep going. And Corey and I were able to dig stuff up. We talked about it on, I don't know if, did did you get to that part in our, our oh, trip? Oh, no, we're Duluth. The Duluth episodes are oh, coming. Oh, that's, that's They're not done yet. Okay, yeah. So it's coming. So it was a lot of fun. But I do want to mention because at the time this drops, it won't be too late. But I picked up a copy of Beware the Eye of Odin. Because first, so I talked about because it it's a local creator. Well, up in Cambridge Library on October, I'm sorry, August 6th. 6 to 7 p.m., Tim Odlin will be there doing a presentation on the making of his comic book, Beware the Eye of Odin. He writes, if you're an aspiring artist, a comic maker, or interested in comic books, this is for you. Open question and answer. He'll have copies of his book. Bring the books. I'll sign them and remark them. I, of course, got my copy signed from Gamer's Den. I got the last one. So hopefully, Tim, go by, drop some more flyers. And of course, if you get up there, uh, I work, let's see, when's the 8th? I work Saturdays. <laughs> but if you're free or want to take a trip up to Cambridge, it'd be a good thing to do. Another thing I discovered while I was at the Cambridge Library, I'm sorry, Gamer's Den, a series called uh, Cardboard Crack. And I looked it up online. It's a web strip based on the world's most addictive game, Magic the Gathering. Now, what got my attention is that the Gamer's Den had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about nine or ten collections of cardboard crack, and they are absolutely hilarious. Stick figures, very simple drawings, but the humor is outstanding. You can check it out online, cardboard slash crack.com and of course in the day of google you want to look it up like cinnamon judge or hate stings type in cardboard crack and you'll find the website check it out and then if you want to buy the books well you can buy them directly from the guy or go up to gamers den and buy them you know that's if nothing gets a retailer store more happy than being able to sell a book for a local creator so that's pretty much it for the the Things that I I'd wanted to cover earlier, but we kind of lost track of. Now, that's not all I want to talk about, because you know me, I we got to fill a whole hour. Some of it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, Corey, do you, do you got your thinking grenades nearby? I always have my thinking grenades okay. nearby. I, I want to ask you, what is the importance, or why would you pay more in back issues, 
for a copy of Secrets of Haunted House number 31. It was around the age of the 50 centers. Yeah. Hmm. I know it wasn't Frank Miller's first story. No, it is a first appearance. Not if, Destiny. Think of the trench coat brigade. That's Books what I'm magic. thinking. I don't know. It is the first appearance of Mr. E. Oh, Why okay. He may be, but evil he can see. And this does not have a code approval on it. Oh, no, there it is. So he was code approved when he showed up. I don't think he's that way anymore. So that was just something fun. Okay, try this one. Why is the Max number 33 so expensive? That was Max being Sam Keith's wonderful series, which needs an omnibus. I don't remember them having backups. Was it the last issue? I think it was uh, because it had a very limited print run as the last few issues of Max were only available via subscription or if specifically requested by retailers. Only 26,600 were made or ordered, meaning about half those actually made it into circulation. So a, a going price for that and some of the other ones, they run about 35 bucks. That was one of those like, I didn't know that, which is another reason why we need an omnibus because I would love to get it. It might have all been done when IDW re redid it all too. I'd have to check because I'm woefully behind on my Max. By the way, Secrets of the Haunted House. Yes. Actually, it's Secrets of Haunted House. Uh -huh. There's no the in it. Yeah, you'd never find it the way I said it. Who were the hosts? Before Mr. Elvira. E. Oh. No. Started in 1975. Hmm. I can't think of anybody because I know Cain and Abel, I think, were around before that. It was all of them. It was Cain, oh. Abel, Eve, and Destiny. And Destiny had moved over from Weird Mystery Tales. Eve was in the Witching Hour where they had the three witches, Cain and Abel. And the reason for that was this was basically an inventory book. Hmm. Oh. Was, we got a whole bunch of these stories. Let's start up another one. And any, you know, basically it's we can shove anything in there. Anything that was uh, created for one of the other one of the other books. Uh, it was there was a special Secrets of Haunted House special in the DC special series with issue. Uh, it was canceled with issue 14 as part of the DC implosion, but it was revived with issue 15 because the horror books were still selling and they were cheap because they used Filipino artists and um, young writers who didn't have much of a track record, so they could pay them bottom base. <laughs> Basically, they could pay them the bottom level. Okay, and it lasted, like it. it lasted until issue 41. Speaking of horror books, Joe, oh. you know how in uh, the last episode, I said that I had completed my collection. Oh, yeah. I asked Roy Thomas through his agent, Chung Chimino, on the Facebooks, about when they started the horror books at Marvel, they were all new stories, and then eventually they went to reprints or adaptations. And I asked, was it a sales thing? Was it a budget thing? Was it an internal thing? Because they were you know, desperately trying to get stuff out on the stands. And what Roy said was that the sales were not where they needed to be for them to have new new stories and when they asked you know basically when they asked fans fans wanted continuing characters and horror anthologies didn't have continuing characters so they did put out reprints to that you know as long as they made a profit which is pretty easy with the reprints in the 70s because they didn't pay anybody reprint, reprint fees. 
and also to shove off the other comic <laughs> companies from the stands. But he said that the they didn't sell to Marvel fans because Marvel fans wanted continuing characters, which is why in books like Supernatural Thrillers, they put in the living mummy. In Strange Tales, they added the Golem and then Warlock. And what was Adventures into Fear became Man Thing. And then after Man Thing, it became Morbius. It was uh, Marvel fan. They realized that if it's not a continuing character, Marvel readers would not buy it anymore. I just looked up. Kind of surprised me. I looked up while you were talking max prices. Oh my gosh. It did go up to issue. 35. I see one for 110 bucks. Jeez. 33 is at 45. 34 is at 90. So, yeah, again, I and I don't have a reading on the IDW books, but cool. Sam, please, omnibus. I would love to get the max all in a single omnibus. I think that and, would be. You know what else is weird about that? Other than a Batman story you did a few years ago, Sam Keith isn't doing much. Maybe he's got the money, doesn't need to. <laughs> well, I doubt that MTV show gave him, you know, like FU money. Yeah, so you're humble. He could also be working outside of comics. It's like, I think the one story that surprised me the most was when we were playing poker with Adam Hughes. And I, I forget who it was, asked him about, you know, ah, you know, you don't do comics anymore. We don't see your name. Yeah, how are, how are you making a living? He said, well, I did an Indiana Jones painting for Steven Spielberg that he paid me $100,000 for. And everybody just kind of went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I think that happens a lot, you know? Oh, by the way, just got an email. Oh. Thanks to you and 842 other backers, the project has reached its funding goals. That's right. We're getting the Cherry Omnibus 40th yeah. anniversary hardcover. So they charged me the over 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I, let me look at my email. I should have. I should be. We've collected your thing. Yep, there it is. <sighs> so there we go. There's literate, well-drawn porn. Cool. <laughs> All right, let's see what other. Uh, by the way, Joe. Yes. First issue was called Cherry Pop Tart. Why did they change it? Oh, there's a certain food conglomerate that took a bit of an exception to that. Now, a lot of people thought that Archie sued them. Archie did not. No, they're not that stupid. Oh, Archie has set threatened. Archie made a living out of threatening Harvey Kurtzman. Come on. Which I found interesting because. I, I found a copy of Super Duck number one yes. from Archie, and this is a 2021. I've somewhere in my vast collection of stuff I have like, but when we were up at Gal uh, Toy Galaxy up in Duluth, he had a Super Duck that I picked up because I just tickled my fancy. Although I notice on the corner it says mature readers only. For Super Duck, I may have to investigate that. Maybe I'll read it later. Speaking of comics that made me go, hmm. We talk, we've talked in the past about Spire comics. Yes. Well, apparently, some of those Archie books are still in print under the Barbour Christian Comics logo. If you look it up, and again, I, I type Barbour, B-A-R-B-O-U-R Publishing, they have a whole line of young adult, feel good, Christian related books. I'm going to put in Archie because when I was digging at Hot Comics on one of my geeking days, I ran across an entire run of these books. And a lot of these look to be reprints from the Archie ones, but these were dated yes. 1987. What it is in the 80s, Barber and Company acquired the rights to republish all of the titles in the Spire Christian Comics line. They now have them under the new Barbour Christian Comics imprint. I, they I say they've been keeeping them in print since 1988. Ow. I have not gone into a Christian bookstore to see since ages and ages and ages ago, because I know 
when I first moved here to Minnesota, you know, back where I lived, there were just bookstores. We did not have Christian bookstores. They had not spread to rural Illinois yet. Now when I go, there's they're there. But there were a bunch of them here, and I went into one. And it's like, oh, wow, they've got the Archie. They had Hansy, the girl who loved the swastika, God Smuggler, Crossing the Switchblade. Uh, what else was there? I'm just looking through their website. I don't oh, think Barney that's... Bear comics. Oh. oh, yeah, Barney Bear. So many Barney Bear comics when I was a kid were given to me. It's like, these are awful. Please stop giving yeah. them to me. Uh, I don't think they're in print anymore. I'm just floating through their website, and if they have them, they are not in print. There you go, Archie. Instead of doing all these horror books, you could republish these in a big omnibus. Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't know. They they they, they sold for a good long time. Oh yeah. And I remember seeing them in a Christian bookstore. It was just I think about it every time I hit the corner of Dale and County Road Beam and. I think it's Roseville because it was a, a store on the corner. It might have been a gift shop, but they had a whole rack of comics and they were all the Spire comics. So just one of those things from your youth that you remember like, oh, yeah, I'll never forget that. It's funny when people were talking about the hardcore Christian comics ages and ages and ages ago. I did not realize that they... It was one of those discussions where I was sitting and listening, and I didn't realize that they were talking about the Jack Chick stuff. Mm. I thought they were talking about the Spire comics until they got into, you know, how they were printed, and no one knows where they come from. They just sort of <laughs> appear. Oh, I used to pick them up at bus stops all the time. That that was one of my things way back, and we'll give an autograph no prize if someone can tell us what episode where one of my freakings was is that somebody busted into the post office box, stole the comics that I was shipping on the eBay. One of the shipments were those Spire comics, not Spire, the, the Jack Chick comics that I had had in my collection. I had like three, four of them, and I just sold them as a bundle to, to sell them. How ironic, stealing Christian comics. <laughs> the one that I do, th I do recall to this day is... You can still buy the uh, Jack Chick books too. Oh yeah, they're out there. I think it was called In the Presence of Mine Enemy about the POW in Vietnam. That one stuck with me for some reason. Uh, I think it was more autobiography, autobiographical than most of the comics. So you pick it up. It's it's. I thought it was a fun read. Or yeah, just go to got, chick, just go to chick.com, click on tracks. Mm -hmm. There are all of the books. Or if you want. You can go find for 50 bucks the hard to find, even though I just found one in the dollar bin, Dexter number one. It had a low print run and it was the first appearance of Dexter Morgan. And apparently that whole run, like nobody's paying attention to until after it was out of print. There you go. Give you a couple clues. Now let's ask Corey another question. Corey, how long has free comic book day been around? Uh, I believe it started in 2002 with the Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man movie. You would think that. However, Free Comic Book Day was actually around way back in 1961. Joel Thingvold, who probably has forgotten more comic book local history than we'll ever remember, posted an ad out of one of the comic Sunday funny prints that goes free comics. Famous classic illustrated from the Big G serials. Oh, so it was more of a giveaway. Yeah. And if you go back, I, it says, yeah, free classic comics for two box tops from any General Mills serial. Choice of three comics and on every package. So, oh, there were. I remember yeah. there was a serial called Sunday Funnies that had a comic book on it that was reprints of comic strips and you'd open the box to read it. And I always thought that was brilliant, but it didn't sell well because they were gone pretty fast. Sunday Funny Serial, you said? I think it was called Sunday Funnies. I'm just putting it in as a generic. Comics doo, doo, doo. on Serial oh, no. Box. Yeah, nothing. Nothing came up. Morning Funnies. Oh, what is it? Morning Funnies. There we go. Yep. 
was produced by Ralston Cereals in 1988 and 1989. Dun, oh, there they are. Yep, yep. Oh, that's kind of fun. Yeah, and the one thing about when you collect cereal boxes, which I found out years ago, it doesn't matter if the cereal's in it. It's probably better if it isn't because no, yeah. stuff get in it. <laughs> so it's perfectly acceptable to have it open and flat. And that's yeah, see, here's some empty boxes. That's kind of fun. Let's see what other goodies I have to share. Oh, I want to mention this because we're really good on in supporting local businesses and stuff like that. But every so often something comes my way. And this is more for people if you live in Calmet City, Illinois. A friend of mine that I met on the road, I'm still pals with today, his sister, Natalie Nichols, opened up a pudding shop. Natalie Nichols Banana Puddings. She opened it up on June 2nd. And again, I was going to talk about it, but things got busy. It's in the River Oak Mall's food court. 96 River Oak Center Drive, Calumet City, Illinois. She's, it, it looks like ice cream. Oh, looks like sundaes. It looks like malts. Oh, this is the wrong thing to eat. I am so hungry. <laughs> so uh, the Minnesota toy community is reaching out on a charity event. It's a reach for Jethro, research, education, and advocacy for children with high sprung disease. Here sprung disease, H-I-R-S-C-H-S-P-R-U-N-G disease. They're doing a kickball tournament September 9th at Cambridge, Minnesota. Again, a lot of action going up in the Cambridge area. Silent auction. Oh, I've been known to be a sucker at a silent auction. They have beverages for people 12 and over. 10 to 12 people per team, registration, 10 bucks a person, $10 a team. All games will be six innings, 45 minutes, no cleats, no uniform requirements. You can register today by calling 763-244-0537 or email caitlin.doberstein at gmail.com. And again, if you need any of that information, just back, backtrack the the soundtrack on our podcast or give me a quick email and I'll, I'll send some for you. I just thought that was nice because some of the Minnesota Funko toy and comic community have been supporting the Doverstein community and here's a chance to help their son Jethro. And let's see what other I, I want to talk about a big story that has kind of flown under the radar until earlier this week. And that is that the magazine Heavy Metal. Oh, yes. It's going to, it ended with issue 320. It was going to start over with a new number one under Massive. And there have been stories leaking for a few years now about late payment, non payment, problems with editorial, problems with people being able to get a hold of the people who run Heavy Metal. And today it was kind of very quietly announced, which is weird that it's on Bleeding Cool and they have a press release. But when I go to The Beat, which is where you go to get your, you know, where you go to get your legit news, they don't have anything on it there. And even on um, Bleeding Cool, it has dropped out of their main page. It's, you know, you have to search for it now. Heavy Metal Magazine from Heavy Metal Entertainment was going to start over with Volume 1, Issue 1 at the beginning of 2023. This would happen after Heavy Metal Entertainment, I'm sorry, after Heavy Metal Entertainment published their final issue. Then that was delayed and delayed and delayed, came out in April, eight months late. And then last weekend at the London Film and Comic Con, Massive was not going to publish the new Heavy Metal Magazine, Volume 2. And the deal had been signed off, but now it is dead. Delays were to give Heavy Metal CEO time to address the changes the company faced. But now 
The publication of Heavy Metal Magazine number 320 back in April 2023 was part of an arrangement with Massive Publishing. In that, Massive paid for the printing of Heavy Metal 320, supplied all outstanding retail orders to comic shops across North America, I'm sorry, North America and the U.S., providing heavy metal entertainment with enough stock to fulfill newsstand and outstanding subscription orders. Let's see. And they're looking here. I got to go through all this other stuff, but it looks like that the relaunch will not be happening. And they had solicited, let's see, one, two, Three. They, I'm sorry, they solicited two issues, and then Ram God, which was a seven-issue miniseries, they had solicited three issues. Star Wars, a graphic novel by Steve Orlando and Ivan Chavrin, had been solicited. The Red by Matthew Medney, Morgan Rosenblum, and John Lamb had been solicited. Lucy by Patrick Norbert and Torino Libertore, Swamp God by Ron Mars and Amito, Black Beacon by Ryan Lindsay and Sebastian Pins, Darkwing, Matthew Medney and German Ponce, Savage Circus by Brandon Columbus and Al Barianovo, all look like that they are not coming out. And to some of the people working on it, it was kind of a surprise. Word has been leaking slowly to them. A number of people are yet to be paid for work they previously did on heavy metal. Heavy metal started in 1977. It was originally published by, the, by National Lampoon. The editor, the people in charge of National Lampoon had seen Metal Hurlant over in France and thought that it would be a good fit for the American market. So they started it here in the U.S. It was part of heavy metal until, see, 80, I have to look it up. I think it was, so it started off as a monthly magazine, then in Let's see, after running for monthly for the first nine years up to December 1985, then dropped to quarterly in 1986. In 1988, film producers Daniel Grodnick and Tim Matheson bought the company that owned National Lampoon and Heavy Metal. In 1992, Kevin Eastman bought Heavy Metal and he published it until let's see when he he sold it off in 2014 but pretty much it was a huge success they had an animated movie in 1982 but by 1986 the bloom had kind of come off the rose it wasn't selling as well as it was neither was national lampoon national lampoon by this time was just a shell of its former self and then by the time Kevin Eastman took it over, it was pretty much just a walking, you know, it was a zombie for the most part. It was being published because, you know, they were mostly printing a lot of the stuff from France that had been in Metal Hurlant. Kevin Eastman took it over and he had all that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles money. He had loved the magazine, so he kept it around. There was a second animated movie, which went direct to video. Which, honestly, I have not seen Heavy Metal 2000. I have it on DVD if you want to borrow it. Is it any good? I haven't opened it. Oh. If so, Julie, obviously, you Julie have Julie Strain is in it. That's, she's Julie. a big part of it. Yeah, and she was married to Kevin Eastman at the time. Whoa, I'm shocked. Shocked. I always laugh because Julie Strain's quoted as saying, yeah, people think it's so great being married to me. Poor Kevin. Every time I'm at home, I just lounge around in sweatshirts. <laughs> By the time he sold it, it was sort of an afterthought. And the la I started picking it up when they announced that Grant Morrison was going to be the editor, starting with issue 280. And Morrison was the editor 
And when he was no longer the edi editor, neither he nor the uh, magazine said anything about it till it had been a couple of issues. And they went, oh, yeah, yeah, here's our new editor. But it looks like that it just sort of faded out of existence slowly over time. I was still picking it up from when I had started picking it up from Grant Morrison because as an anthology and it was using a lot of new basically it was using a lot of new stories that were and thought that were continued. So I kind of got hooked on it, was continuing to read it. I can't point to anything and say this is brilliant, but it was, you know, heavy metal was always the art was amazing and the stories were eh, they were OK. I remember and, buying it for when I had hot comics, just one up. I had all the stuff that was adult orientated up high and it didn't. I didn't have people buying it regularly, but they sold. And I don't think a hell of a lot of them came out in the 90s. No, it bi-monthly when Eastman took over. He was able to get it up to bi-monthly from what I have read a lot of their sales were through subscriptions. And when I look at the price of the subscriptions, like, holy shit, how can anybody mm -hmm. afford that? Well, by the end, the magazine was 15 bucks a pop because it wasn't getting much in the way of advertising. But I would say that heavy metal changed the perception of comics for a lot of people, even more so than underground comics did because heavy metal was on newsstands. You know, you went, when you went to the grocery store, when you went to the, the drug store, when you went to the bookstore, there it was. It was not for kids. There was a movie that did very well, an R-rated movie that did very well. But it pretty soon, comics themselves sort of caught up and passed it because you had the direct market and a lot of the people who sort of moved into comics through heavy metal, then filtered into indie comics. And by the, by the time Kevin Eastman took over, it was very much just people who liked art and people who bought comics just for art. With that said, I have a question. Does the Strode know? What is significant about Dell Comics number 937, Rough and Ready? Is that four color comics? It is four color. <sighs> Rough and Ready. Yep. In the deepest Africa, scary safari. And it's got like a dog with a hat, a pink elephant holding an umbrella. And what only I can guess would be a mouse or a cat with a safari hat. Well, I know Rough and Ready was the first cartoon that Hanna-Barbera did. So was it the first comic based on a TV cartoon? It was, according to what I'm reading, the first Hanna-Barbera comic ever. No, Tom and Jerry I, came out long before that. Tom and Jerry, though, was MGM. It wasn't nope. at the time Hanna it wasn't. Look at who created Tom and Jerry. Oh, I'm not saying they didn't create it. It wasn't part oh, of Hanna-Barbera. Oh, you mean the Tom and, you mean the individual Hanna-Barbera studio? Then yeah. yes. Yeah. So again, this, and I'll have to research a little more, but they're saying this is the first Hanna-Barbera property. Yep. I could see that. Yeah. Because Hanna-Barbera And again, that always confused me too, because I was like, wait a minute, Hanna-Barbera, isn't Tom and Jerry part of them now? And eventually. Well, it is. Yeah. When MGM shut down their animation, Hanna-Barbera bought Tom and Jerry. Did that lead to the Chuck Jones manic Tom and Jerry? Yes. Oh, and I love those. That was in the 60s. Yes, I love those. I saw a lot of reruns. Ugh. Tom and Jerry was a weird cartoon when you go back and watch it. There was a time when they were showing it. You know, you've got that 630 slide. Mm -hmm. which I have read a lot about now. For those of you on the East Coast, it was the 730 slot. And what it was, network TV used to go here in the Midwest from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And in the seven, well, it, it was was it was the late 60s, early 70s. I would need to look up the exact time. But the Federal Communication 
the FCC said the networks had to give back an hour to local channels for local programming. And what many of them started to do was they would then have an hour long nightly newscast. But it wasn't long before they cut their local news to a half hour and would drop in an animated, I'm sorry, a syndicated show. You got a lot of reruns. I remember as a kid, it was like, okay, one is showing all in the family reruns. One is showing Happy Day reruns. One is showing Carol Burnett reruns. And then it's okay, they're going to show Tom and Jerry from 6.30 to 7 for, you know, a while. And then eventually, when Wheel of Fortune hit that slot in 82, they became hugely successful. And it became, all right. Whoever has Wheel of Fortune is going to be number one in the market. Then you would have another show like either Entertainment Tonight or in the uh, Insider or Inside Edition or whatever. And then the other channel would usually just do another half hour of local news because it's like, OK, we can't compete against Wheel of Fortune because everybody's watching that. So we might as well do stuff where we can. The people who buy ads, we can highlight their businesses with puff pieces. The final things for my cornucopia of stuff is if you're looking for a complete run of Babylon 5, they're going to be releasing it on Blu-ray December 5th, 2023. Pre-orders, well, they started as we we're speaking, so you're a week behind to catch up. But the only thing I can say is that uh, J. Michael Straczynski was not directly involved. He does know he he does know that it will include the gathering, but not the movies or crusade. And because the gathering was the pilot, technically first episode, that's why it's included. But the other stuff is not. And it's a legitimate part of the series, kind of like a pilot episode. It's done in the same very nice four to three master ratio done for HBO Max which I guess it's no longer on HBO Max. It's on Amazon, I think. So you should get a much better bit rate. It should look even better than there. The commentaries, which are on the originals, are not included because with everything else, they said it wasn't feasible. And again, that's what Straczynski was told. He's not involved with the re-release and he does not have any inside information about foreign release or anything else. So if you're looking for a link where it's available, it's everywhere you go online to buy stuff. So check it out. I have a question. I heard that the Babylon 5 reboot has now turned into a movie. I don't know about the reboot because like everything in Hollywood, it's on hold. However, it has not been killed outright by CW. And they're also leaning more towards an animation because that way you can get you can tell time anywhere in the Babylon 5, because the problem with Babylon 5, problem, strength, beginning, middle, end. It's not open-ended like almost any other property. Most of the actors, the cool ones, have passed away, or heaven forbid, they aged. So they might not look good on the screen, but if they do animated, they can do voice with the remaining actors and figure out a way to secure the rights for the actors who have passed beyond the veil. So that's all we know. And that's pretty much all Straczynski said. I will mention though, I mentioned earlier about the return of Falcon, October 28th, 2023 at the Bloomington Armory. Go to MC, mncba.org for more information and all that fun. The return again of PNJ Comics. Next to us will be the lovely prize lady, Lisa Edmondson. Next to him will be one of the mainstays, the found, one of the founders, I think. I think it's fair to say, Brian Wilson of the MCBA. He's bringing his stuff because I talked to him the last time I saw him and I said, and that's all I've got. I'm caught up with all my little tidbits that I wanted to share over the past couple of weeks, months, you know what, years. You know what tidbit I want to share? Are you podcasting again for PW Insider, covering everything live as it happened? Well, not only that, I want to tell you about these guys, our sponsors. 
Our newest sponsor is NordVPN. Let's be honest, if you're out on the internet, you need a VPN to protect you. There's all sorts of things going on on the internet where people can track you, you could accidentally download a keylogger, uh, all sorts of things. NordVPN gives the best security possible. It has a password manager which generates complex passwords, syncs across all your devices, stores your notes and credit card information. It also gives you 10 gigabytes of private cloud storage, um, secure files that backs up your data automatically. But the main thing it gives you is peace of mind. It gives you peace of mind when you're um, out on the internet, when you're streaming, when you're playing games, when you're listening to podcasts like this one. It gives you safety anywhere at any time. It protects your online activity. You get full access to all content. And if you use the link, go.nordvpn.net sh3ku, it'll take you to where you can get a great deal for a one-month plan, a two-year plan, a one-year plan. They are our newest sponsor. We're happy to have them. And if you would like to sponsor something here at any of the podcasts on the Solitaire Rose Network, you can. Just email me, network at gmail.com. Thanks. Oh, I love a good sponsor. And now it's time for Retro Reviews. Joe, what's your retro review this week? I thought I would go back and... Read a comic from Captain Marvel. No, no, not your boring, yet soon to be excited since Jim Carlin or Jim Starlin took over or the the Photon Monica superhero or the Sun L or whatever. No, no, I'm going back to the original Captain Marvel. His brand new first issue with one magic word, Shazam. And on the cover, which was part Nick... Cardi, I believe, drawing Superman and C.C. Beck and all his Becky gloriness doing Billy Batson, Captain Marvel, because he says the magic word and becomes the world's mightiest mortal. And of course, on the inside page, in 1894, boys had to learn to act like a man. Daisy's 1894 BB gun teaches them the same lessons. And you can get a trap. It's basically an ad for BB, BB guns, which I don't think they do anymore. But you could get a target trap for $1.99, which is a $4 value with any purchase of any Daisy BB gun. And they were out of Rogers, Arkansas. My copy is my beloved copy that I had signed in 1980 by C.C. Beck. Best wishes, Joe, C.C. Beck. And By the way, Daisy does still exist. They do still sell BB guns. They probably don't advertise in comic books. Well, no, they probably can't afford it. Yeah, there is that. Let's Although see, if back... you want the, uh, what is it, the Red Rider Heritage BB gun? Oh, yeah. $85.90. Ah, never last. I'm trying to read the small print here because, let's see, Shazam Volume 1, Number 1, February 1973, published monthly with the exception of January, March, July, and November by National Periodic Publications. And let's see, the copyright is, so they owned... Captain Marvel at this time. They had the little subscription comic blurb, which would have cost you for 15, 20 cent issues, $3 in the US in possessions, $4 elsewhere. Shazam, after 20 years, the triumphant return of the world's mightiest mortal, the original Captain Marvel, a retelling of the greatest legends in comics by Denny O'Neill writer, CC Beck artist, Julia Schwartz editor. It starts with Billy walking down the street. Hello there, Mr. Binder. Get it? Hello, Billy. Hello, boy. What? Billy Batson? Yes. But, but you've been missing for 20 years. You have an age. You're still a kid. How come? It's a long story, Mr. Binder. You just wouldn't believe it. As Mr. Binder walks away, I must be flipping my guard. Billy's thinking, I can't believe it myself. And he goes back to recant the origin where he's selling papers on a corner on a cold subway night. And psst, lad, come here. Yes, sir. Want a paper? No, son. It's late. Why aren't you home in bed? I have no home, sir. I sleep in the subway station, but it's warm there. Follow me. A mysterious figure led me. This is Billy talking in a murky abandoned tunnel. Suddenly a strange subway car with headlights gl 
gleaming like a dragon's red eye, roaring through the station and stopped, although no one was driving it. Have no fear, a mystic power will safely guide us, Billy, enter. We traveled the end of the line to where my strange companion led me into the mouth of a cavern. Suddenly, I found myself in an ancient underground hall carved out of solid rock by lit by flaring torches. As he walks by, you see the seven deadly enemies of man. Pride, envy, greed, hatred. I can't read the rest because it's very, very small print. Only to come across a majestic figure on a great throne. I am Shazam, an ancient Egyptian wizard. For thousands of years, I have fought evil, Billy Batson. How do you know my name? Because I know everything. Beeping Tom, he is. But now my time is up, and I have chosen you to be my successor. Me, sir? Yes, you are pure of heart. Speak my name. Shazam! Boom! A thunderclap from the ends of the universe. Ice searing bolt of magic lightning. And I found myself transformed into the world's mightiest mortal. That same unbelievable instant, the block of stone that had hung by a thread above the wizard's throne crashed down. So it is written, I must go. Kabaya crash. Holy moly, that poor guy. Oh, don't mourn for me, Billy, as a ghost arises and lights a flame. Although my body's no more, my spirit lives on in ethereal form. Should you ever need me, you only have to light this brazier. Brazier? Brazier? And I shall return. Brazier. I like brazier better. I dub you Captain Marvel. Through my name, you are given the powers of these six mighty heroes. Corey, who are those six mighty heroes? Oh, gosh. Okay, Solomon for wisdom, Hercules for strength, Atlas for stamina, Zeus for power, Achilles for courage, and Mercury for speed, which is real interesting because all but one of them, I should say Solomon's a biblical hero, not necessarily a, a mythical figure. Anyways, thank you, great sir. Shazam disappears. Billy thinks, but that's just a marvel. For the next few years, I made good my promise. I mean, Captain Marvel's promise. I fought doers everywhere, and I usually won. Then the world's wickedest scientist found a way to exile me. Well, exile's over, and I'm going after the man who caused it. I thought he got blown. I thought he got blown up, and thought he was Mickey Moran for a long time until. Oh, that's Miracle Man. Never mind. I don't have time to talk to you because the next ad is for Sally. Visit the Easy Bake Oven Toy Factory in cartoon form. And this is where Kenner makes its greatest girls toy since dolls. Golly, look at all the Easy Bake Ovens. I had a, a friend who had Easy Bake Ovens. And the biggest downfall was, was when the light bulb inside burned out or they ran out of the special Easy Bake Mix bonus. But here, for 75 cents, you could send in your name and get Six mix assortments. Uh, so on the next page, the world's wickedest plan. And let's see. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Captain Marvel basically stops a crime. People are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're around. The cops pull him away. Well, it's good to see you. You know, they sold a lot of electronic supplies from a warehouse, transformers, stuff like that. We figure they're working for somewhere else. And Billy's like, I'll bet I know who the someone else is as Captain Marvel drifts away. People are like, are, are you Captain Marvel? He, he sure is. I remember him from when I was a little kid. He doesn't look a day older. Where you been, Captain? Tell us what happened to you. Now, now, folks have a lot to do. Besides, you wouldn't just believe me. Okay, we have a quick ad for Wayne School, in case you've never finished your high school diploma. Now you can go back and get a diploma without going back. 7, 417 South Dearborn Street. I think that was by a uh, train station. So basically, what had happened is... Billy, his sister, Mary Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr. and I were being honored by the mayor. All of our friends were there. Suddenly we were caught in a strange ray pulled along into the sky, along with some of the crowd. Before any of us could act, we were drawn into deep space. I caught a glimpse of a familiar spaceship and knew who was inside, the world's wickedest scientist, Dr. Theodos. Oh, that's some bad lettering. We know him as Sylvania, his daughter, Georgia, and his Slimy son, although it comes up summy son because the L and the I are together. <laughs> Sylvania Jr. I can't read it. I can't. It must be so dog. We did it, kids. The vortex transporter paralyzes. Beam snared the big red cheese. Hey, hey, hey. To say nothing of the wicked Mary cheese and that bratty Jr., the little big cheese. As soon as I press this button, they'll be sealed in a global suspendium. They'll be suspended animation forever and we'll be able to rule the world. Savannah so Jr. slaps his dad. His dad falls over. Don't watch it. You're slapping. You knocked me in the controls. We're jammed. I can't steer the ship. 
We're heading for the suspendium globe. We can't stop. It hit the globe. Instantly, the ghastly suspendium put the Sylvanians. Am I saying his name right? Sylvanians into suspended animation too. The ship had crashed near me and I found my head only inches away from his head. No matter though, we were all held motionless. For two decades, we orbited the sun, drawing closer and closer. Eventually, we came within a million miles of blazing orb and the heat began vaporizing the suspendium and I awoke. He said the magic word, shrunk down to Billy, said Shazam again, freed Mary Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr. They pushed the suspendium back to earth, punched it, and everybody that was inside, including, well, I guess for the identification of Mary Marvel's friends, see the Marvel family friends, see next, see the issues text feature. So we'll get there in a second. And then of course, Shazam ran off, was able to capture, punch out everybody. I don't think you'll get a suspended sentence. Yeah, you're a smart aleck, Captain Marvel. Is that all you have to say, you big red cheese? No, there's one thing. It's great to be alive, right? Right. Next issue, the return of the nefarious Mr. Mine. And of the other people that got trapped, Uncle Dudley, of course, Uncle Marvel, Miss Joan Jameson, Billy and Captain Marvel's secretary. She accidentally saw Billy slip away to change into Captain Marvel, convince him that a good secretary could save him some trouble and still conceal his identity. Stealing Morris, the owner of the station whiz, Sissy Summerlee, Billy's girlfriend, Pa Potter, Billy's landlord, because Billy rented an apartment there, Ma Potter, Professor Edgewise, who uh, lives in the same boarding house as Freddie Freeman, Butana Sylvana, the elder daughter of Captain Marvel's arch enemy, who is beautiful and not evil, Mr. Talkie Tiny, <laughs> Talkie Tawny, the talking tiger. God, take that, Calvin and Hobbes. So they all came back. Let's see, the next ad you can, for $2 each, buy $2, get one free. RP Albums. Jesus How Christ, about Superstar. LP albums? Nope, nope. 71 Rocks Hits. Go Away Little Girl, The Nickel Song, Sweet and Innocent, Bubblegum Music, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, One Monkey, Don't Stop, No Show. You could get The King and Queen of Country Music. I can't read it. Janine Riley and Johnny Cash. After that, they did some... Golden Age reprints, The Endless String. You get an ad for Corgi Baby and all their, oh my gosh, that Batmobile that was $4 then. Oh, can't hate to see what the price would be now. So they were getting a little mileage out of, they first of all, they, they kept the continuity of the old Captain Marvels, which was brilliant. They gave a, an explanation of why everybody was the way they were. And of course, everybody's like, oh yeah, we just accept it. Yeah, the, the owner of the number one station in town disappears for 20 years and nobody thinks about it. You get your big ad with all the the tiny little things that you can get from right, with a COD check for 50 cents, a joy buzzer, werewolf mask, how to learn karate, a seven foot tall monster. Let's see where else we go. That The ads were big news because DC Comics was doing 100 page specials. They got the Batman there printed. The other ads are you can get a high job paying job in drafting by sending, get a free coupon for drafting career. There's a 27 foot tall monster sized cutout, the glowing dark, or you could get the skeleton, Bobby the skeleton. Want 100 toy soldiers for $1.25? They're all yours. Corey, don't be half a man. The insult that made a man out of Mac. Final page is the Aurora AFX. This must be, is this their models? Oh, these are models because they had the slot car going as well. So that was all in 73. Most of Captain Marvel continued that same run where they'd do a new story, do a lot of back issues. They're starting to go up in price. The crazy price one, of course, and it might be going down was, I believe, number 28. The first Silver Age, modern age appearance of Black Adam. Maybe it was 27. It was a fun run. It's been reprinted in hard covers. I don't know if it's in soft covers, but you know, as DC does, they print it and let it go out of print. So there you go, Corey, the original Captain Marvel. I thought you meant the real Captain Marvel. Wait, this isn't the real Captain Marvel? No, the real Captain Marvel came out 
Let's see. In April of 1966, in a giant action issue, the all-new Captain Marvel with Plastic Man. Wow. Yeah. I have the 1966 version of Captain Marvel. And I will get into who published it and everything after I do the review. And the review is, this is one of the worst goddamn comics I have ever read in my life. <laughs> it is from an idea, says, based on a character created by Carl Burgos. Joe, who was Carl Burgos? I'm, I'm still trying to find the book. Carl Burgos was the creator of the original Human Torch. Oh, wow. The script was by Ralph Elwood. The art was by Francho. And this is a story of another robot. We start with our Captain Marvel, who's wearing a, uh, a white button-up shirt, looking in the mirror, has no idea who he is. Says that uh, the house looks like a hospital. And then he remembers that he's a robot. And the scientists on this planet have created him and given him great powers, such as... He doesn't know his powers at all. He's in a room with a bunch of books, and there's a book that's too high for him to reach. So he says, I, I love this. That book, Astrophysics by Marvel, it's too high. Can't reach it. Got to get it split. And his arm flies off and grabs the, grabs the book. My hand, it flew from my arm. It's grabbing the book. Zam, my hand rejoined my arm. Why did I say that? Sam? Zam, X-A-M. Oh, okay. So he remembers that he went through a rigorous training <laughs> if, from the scientists who create him. And if he says the word split, he pops apart. And for the command for all his parts to return, he just says Zam, X-A-M, and everything returns to normal. He can have his fingers fly off. He can have his hand fly off. He can have his legs take off on their own. He has his head leave and go look at the city, but everything is broken. Something terrible has happened. The scientist says that we're the victims of the war. That's why you were created for the good of man, because, war, because of war, our planet will be destroyed and we'll die. But we'll discuss that another time. <laughs> Now back to the exercises. Details at 11. <laughs> he then is told that if he ever starts to run low on power, on his purple outfit is the letter M. Every day you will rub your hand over it, thereby, and thereby retain your powers at maximum. So that's his weakness. He has to rub his chest once a day. Oh Not as good as having to recharge a Green Lantern ring. Not as good as kryptonite. Not as good as having an aunt who's always dying of a heart attack. Or being muffled so you can't say your magic word. Yeah. So, at that moment, the earth trembled under the crescendo of bombs that whipped the ground into a frenzy of atomic horror. Now, the story started with him flashing back to how he was created and how he was trained. We're still in this flashback. Remember the scientist who said, we'll talk about that later? Well, there is no time to talk about it later. We're at war. Take these Astro Boots. They will enable you to fly through space. Hurry. So he takes off. Then from a thousand miles up, I watched the planet I was born on disintegrate into a million pieces. So what does Captain Marvel say when he sees his home, the planet, and all these people killed. Now I'll have to find a new home. <laughs> I thought it might be, hey, I had a good run. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he floats in space, lands on Earth, and, you know, he's in this house that was the, when the flashback began, right? Mm hmm. So he's putting the shirt back on that he had on in on the splash page. And for some reason, it came off while he was telling the story. But he's putting it back on. Uh-oh, looks like someone's coming. A young boy. I wonder who he is and what he wants. And the young boy comes in and says, say, you look kind of funny. Have you forgotten your friend Billy from the USA? 
USA. Uh, oh, yeah, Billy, come in. Forgive me. It was a rough night. <laughs> so somehow his memory got erased so that we could get the flashback. And that Billy wouldn't say, you know, I, I'm I'm a kid down the block. I, you know, you know, Billy just barges in. Hi, I'm Billy from the USA. And then all of a sudden, Captain Marvel remembers everything. They talk about how he landed on Earth, how he met Billy, how Billy helped him get a house and buy, bought him clothes, including a suit, after which I landed a job as a writer for an important press service. Then I purchased this house, right, Billy? Sure thing, Captain Marvel. And uh, that's our first story. What about Plastic Man? Oh, that's coming later because our second story oh. is Captain Marvel is in an airplane and it's attacked by aliens. I forgot. And I forgot. The, this is a giant action issue. Oh, yeah. So our second story, uh, basically, the uh, airplane is going through an electric storm. All of a sudden, they see a giant wall with a face on it. And I'm not talking, you know, it's a mountain or no, they just uh, uh, half the panel. They drew a line down the panel drew another line, two dots, two lines, and a mouth. So the plane goes through the face and ends up on another planet with everybody involved. Captain Marvel's the only one who sees that there are giant footprints around. Everybody else is just, well, we better get blankets and rations. Somebody will come save us soon. And Captain Marvel finds a giant computer in the middle of nowhere where he finds stone tablets with pictographs on it that explain that in the past, <laughs> we are a doomed race, doomed by our own foolish acts and by probing into the infinite. We attained greatness, miraculous powers, super civilizations on whatever world we colonized. Then one day we discovered we weren't alone. We were merely on the other side of the curtain, the curtain that separated our civilization from another one on the other side of the fourth dimension. We tried to communicate, to extend our hand in peace, but our ships were fired upon and we were destroyed by these creatures. So Captain Marvel spends the, the rest of the story escaping, getting captured, escaping getting captured escaping by the way the aliens look like uh, somebody took a domino and drew arms and legs on it the way he escapes is he finds a manhole cover in the aliens building climbs down but the hole is too big for the aliens who this is their headquarters the hole is too small for the aliens to follow him <laughs> so he goes out and the aliens have decided that they're going to threaten the people that if captain marvel doesn't turn himself in they will kill them captain marvel uh decides to to you know surrender the humans have all been captured they've been put in a zoo they are hostages just as you will be until the electronic one surrenders Captain Marvel does show up, he surrenders, and when he does, the aliens say, we need your electricity, your electricity, we don't have enough power to get home, with your electricity, we'll be able to get home. So Captain Marvel hooks himself up to the machine and rubs his chest, there it is again. The aliens machine is back to full power, they all go back to their own planet. The plane takes off. They go back to Earth. The aliens say, it is done. Goodbye, friends. And as they go back into the regular Earth, no one remembers what happened. <laughs> One more story where the blue men of Venus show up. They put together a deal 
where they have been escaping. They're, they're basically here to capture a prisoner, but the prisoner captures Captain Marvel first. Captain Marvel has to uh, defeat the prisoner, but you know who stops him from defeating the prisoner? That's right, Plastic Man. Welcome to the prison of Plastic Man. Marvel is shocked to see an adversary, Plastic Man, the most dangerous man from the planet of the Blue Men. They fight for two pages. The uh, prisoner is returned. Plastic Man is put in a metal prison, but he will return. There you go, kids. 52 pages. Oddly enough, there was not a second issue. There was, however, when he fought Dr. Fate, Adam Jaw, Elastic Man, Tiny Man, and Dr. Doom. Yes. But that was in uh, Captain Marvel Presents the Terrible Five. Yeah, which actually came out the same month. Yeah, so I'm not going to read anymore. You'd have to go find that on your goodness on your own. And uh, it is public domain, so you can download it all by yourself. Who is the person who uh, created this god-awful mess? Well, I said it was created by Carl Burgos. Carl Burgos worked for a man named Myron Fass. Myron Fass was a fly-by-night publisher back in the 50s. In the 60s, he wanted to jump on the superhero bandwagon, and he realized that Captain Marvel had fallen out of copyright, so he rushed to get a Captain Marvel comic into production. However, Martin Goodman also rushed a Captain Marvel comic into production, and um, Martin Goodman had better lawyers than Myron Fass. Yeah. Myron Fass published under MF Enterprises, now, they believed that this was going to be a bi-monthly comic, and you could have bought a six-issue subscription for $1.50, single copy, $0.25. Cents. Myron Fass then went on to publish tons of knockoff magazines of horror comics, and we've talked in the past about how he would take old horror comics and have his artists add more gore to them and publish them as new stuff. Or they would take old comic stories and have new artists draw them. And believe it or not, he was able to keep those magazines going all through the 70s. He then, in the 80s, moved to Florida and started publishing a lot of one-shot yeah, conspiracy magazines, magazines about Elvis. And by the end of his life in the 90s, he had pretty much gone round the bend and thought the FBI was trying to kill him and he'd gone fully paranoid. But boy, there were a lot of shitty comics that he did. And Carl Burgos, who felt that he got ripped off by Martin Goodman, would take any opportunity he could in any of Myron Fass's books to make fun of Martin Goodman, Stan Lee, and anything Marvel published. So there you go. Hooray. On, on the buy, borrow, ignore, this is a burn it, burn it so that it may not live again. As far as the Shazam goes, eh, if you like it, it's definitely an aged piece, but it was so fun to see Shazam back in the original CC Beck form. And good luck and now, finding it. Now it's time for my favorite part of the show. Gargling with Gershwin. No, no. What? Oh. No, no, no. Not where I do a complete hero history of the Looney Tunes character, Sam the Clam. Oh. No, it's freaking a geeking Joe. What are you freaking on? I heard he was steamed. Let's see. Freaking. I've only got one thing I'm freaking on. During our travels... To Duluth and back. I did a fairly long, maybe monotonous soliloquy about video games I've played in the past and why I've dropped them. Most of it came because something would change. Uh, they were at interactive games. Somebody sadly would pass away, which is weird because they're people I didn't physically know. I didn't even know what they looked like, but you got to know them through gameplay and then the game's kind of drifted apart and things like that. I have no idea if it's going to make it into the podcast or not. Uh, if you do, so be it. The, the punchline was, if anybody's got a decent online game, 
you know, some of them I, I looked at like the Star Trek online game. And yeah, it's like a city building universe building game. But you got the super powerful preying on the super weak. And it's like, that ain't what I want. One game. And again, I'll give a Joe prize out to whoever figures it out. A long time ago, I complained about Simpsons tapped out. They did an update. The Android phone was now obsolete. Couldn't play it. Buildings were disappearing. It wouldn't load. Now, when I play an online video game, I will spend money on it. Developers, listen to what I'm saying. I mean, if I enjoy it, I figure, you know what? I'm from the age where I used to drop, I want to say 50 bucks. There's probably more on quarters every weekend going to the video arcade, buying video games. If I like it, I'll buy it online. If I buy it, I'll buy a power up. I'll buy a boosted. I know they're freemium games, but I figure that's my way to keep going. Some of the games I've played in the past, I stopped playing because they either got ridiculously hard and you had to buy it, or it was just they stopped doing decent updates or there was a bug. Simpsons Tapped Out has a bug. As far as I know, it's for people with Android 22s, of which I have. I don't know, EA, this is a $1,200 phone. Getting a replacement device is not an option, but you upgraded it. And this has been for last three months. Buildings disappear. They're there. I still get income from them. I can like put the Sin City mode on and see where the outline of the building is. Can't see them. If you played the game, you know they have the city divided by a mountain range that you put your rail through. You put a tunnel through and then you can rebuild on the other side. Can't see it. It's impossible to play the game. It's impossible to buy buildings or get buildings and place them because I can't figure out where they were placed. I'm throwing in the towel again because the developers go quiet. They go silent. They know the issue. Believe me, there's a lot of people complaining about this, but they don't even issue like, yeah, we're aware of it. We apologize. Let's try to get it working. The studios are aware of this. You think why? Because, hey, Income's going to drop if I ain't buying stuff from these guys. And believe me, during the strike, they probably want as much licensing income as they can get. It's been a month and a half, maybe even actually probably longer. I don't know how long the last event lasted. I think two months. They're into another event and there's no sign of it switching. So I, I hate to leave. I've got like 2000 donuts in this game. Donuts is their premium pay. And they've actually made it quite easy to get donuts once you get once you start playing. So, and I like buying during an event. I like buying the extra donuts. It's like twenty bucks, real cash, because they usually toss out a favorite character. Have not bought anything. Have not spent the donut. Have not done anything with the character except the ones I need to complete whatever the task. And even then, I can only store the prizes because I can't figure a way to build on my thing. Guys, get your freaking act together here. What is it? Are you going to go away until like Samsung, the next Samsung phone comes out next year? It's unheard of. I mean, all the Apple users are about helpful as rotten apples. Well, you just need to get another device. Not if I drop 1200 bucks on a phone. I expect it to work now. <sighs> I think that's enough ranting for me for a day. Corey, what you geeking, freaking about? Sorry. Oh, I have a few things. Just off your he's he's not saving it up for Festivus, folks. Um, let's see. Saturday. In the park. AEW had a uh, two-hour uh, collision, which was fantastic. Go out of your way to watch that show. Collision is everything I want from a wrestling show. It's been five weeks. Every week has been great. But that's a two-hour show. It was followed by the hour-long Battle of the Belts, which is... Every match is a championship match. They've done seven of them, and not a single one has had a championship change. But that means that I was typing up wrestling for three straight hours. Next morning, I had to be up and at the group home for 12 hours. And that's a lot of, and it was the house where everybody except my buddies in a wheelchair. So that's a lot of repositioning people and lifting people and changing people and carrying people. And then uh, when I got everybody in bed, um, 
Joe, you know, you know that uh, thing you put up of how uh, your your the different kinds of poop. No shit. Uh, what was the one at the top? Was that the uh, not enough water in your diet? That, no, no, no. He, that's at the bottom. Oh, okay. Then it would one be too top. much too much fat in your diet. Yeah, uh, where everything's liquid. Yes. Yes. I had that happen to two out of the three clients in oh. their bed as I'm changing them. Who's it's like, oh, these guys like assholes? Oh, so, um, yeah, yeah, that's not a fun clean. So I got home. It was, by the way, Saturday, Sunday was uh, National Ice Cream Day. So the ice cream at the uh, local uh, local bodega gas station convenience store was half price. Oh, the confessionary. I'm sorry. I spent the day screaming at people. Good thing I was at work. I... Uh, Bought myself a half price pint of ice cream, ate that ice cream, watched a couple TV shows, and was uh, dead asleep. The next day, woke up, had my uh, office job, had to go back to the group home. And I was there, and once again, <laughs> not as bad, but a lot of cleaning. And I realized that I had been working since around six o'clock Saturday to 10 o'clock on Monday. If you listen to earlier episodes of this podcast, I did that all the time. Not anymore. I'm too old for this shit. Uh, here in Minnesota, we are not getting hit by the heat wave yet, but it is coming. The U.S. Yeah. is being hit by a brutal heat wave. Down in Arizona, it is hitting 120 I believe next week we're going to be in the 90s. The, that, millions of people getting brutal heat that is uncharacteristic. Like L.A., you know, L.A.'s hot, but not Africa hot. L.A. is Africa hot. I hear even San Diego. Joe and I went to the San Diego Comic-Con in 2001, and we were shocked at how it felt like fall. Nope, San Diego, hot. Every place hot. And... Um, of course, it's not global warming. Nope. No, it's just uh, our summers are hotter and hotter and hotter. I think, what, last week was the hottest week in the history of the world since we've been keeping track of temperatures. And next week's going to be hotter. And it's just going to keep going like this. So, Joe, I hope you know that in a few years I will be doing the show from the uh, Northwest Territory in Canada. I might be with you. We're actually still looking at moving up north. So I know the I know the one thing, just to sidebar, you know, I've got rheumatoid arthritis. The few times I've been deployed down south in Vegas and other places, it felt good because it's dry heat. But oh, when those hot, hot days come, I would sit out front and the guys would look at me like, are you OK? I said, no, I'm just enjoying the heat because we don't get this in Minnesota. You can't live in it. You'd be living from air conditioning to air conditioning. Not to mention these places don't have water. I, I, I'm going to just move closer to Lake Superior because that water is going to be there forever. Not because people don't want it. In fact, there's very powerful interests that want to drain the lake and send it down. Oh, south. yeah. They're Canada ain't putting up with it. Nope. And you, you don't buy politicians in Canada the way you find them for sale in our United States. So not nowhere on the great lakes is that going to happen end of um, sermon there was an announcement made in the past couple of days that michael olsan olslan best known for the guy who put together the batman movies has been an executive producer on all the batman movies and tv shows he has he and his son are working with the recently announced dan lee comics line to publish digital comics they will be Developing and publishing 12 new series based on never before Stan Lee properties. Now is not the time to put out a new line of comics, 12 books. They're going to get lost in the shuffle. I hate to say it, but most of Stan's stuff since he 
since he left Marvel back in the 90s has been sort of not that good. None of these things have ever been successful. And I cannot think of a comic line where it's, we've got 12 new interlocking superhero books that has ever succeeded. Even Image gave up on that and Image made a bajillion dollars. It's a poor idea. It's a poor plan. It's a, again, I tell this story all the time. Hey, I want to get a comic shop slash comic publisher slash whatever, whatever, whatever. Tell you what, why don't you take all that money, get it in dollar coins, flush it down the toilet one by one. And when it backs up, whatever is left is, you know, probably more than you'll make with your comics. It's a poor idea. I don't understand why people from outside the comic market look at the market and go, man, there's a lot of money to be made there because there's not. There's just not. Joe, what are you geeking on? A couple of things I've been reading. I've been reading a lot of comics. The first one was a Star Trek annual. It's a countdown to the day of blood crossover. This is published by IDW. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. So to bring you up to speed, the USS. The, I, uh, damn my. Theseus is an, it's an experimental starship crewed by a Starfleet legends. And again, in the IDW universe, you were talking Scotty, Crusher, Beverly Crusher, Benjamin Sisko, Data. It's a who's who of Star Trek. The USS Theseus, her warp core runs on a contained neutron star. Her computer system is a ship-wide neural network. She has faced down gods and monsters Many of your systems remain a mystery, even to her creator, the legendary engineer Montgomery Scott. And as the story goes on, we'll have guest appearances. You can tell right on the cover, there's James J. Kirk, the classic Kirk. And apparently the other uh, particular Starfleet ships don't particularly like what's going on with this ship because they in mass attack. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. There is the Phoenix. There's the Enterprise G. There's the current Enterprise from Strange New Worlds. There's the Enterprise from the Kelvin universe. There's Defiant. Some, there's the E. Something's going on here. And hey, look at that. There's Stafford Cockrum. So who else pops up? Oh, uh, the guy, the uh, Bajoran security officer from Strange New Worlds. I can't even think of his name. And there's uh, Ensign, Ensign Sato from the, the linguist from Enterprise. Hey, there's Kraft and Christopher Pike. What in hell's bells is going on here? Well, I don't want to give away too much because half the fun is discovering it. But all your favorites are in here. If you just want to read one Star Trek book, and get a gist of what's going on. This is a good one because it's a standalone story and you're brought up to speed pretty fast because you already know half these characters. So I definitely recommend it. Star Trek Annual by. I always love I recommended this in my previews. I finally got it. it's called Nuking Alaska by Peter Dunlap Scholl. Notes in an Atomic Future. If as if in mid-century Alaska, you needed more ways to die. Well, Peter Dunlap Scholl grew up on the front lines of the Cold War where Alaska residents lived in the shadow of a nuclear arsenal nine times the size of the Soviet Union's. This graphic novel recounts the surprising and tragic comic deaths, details, I'm sorry, of the threats faced by Alaskans, including Project Sh uh, Chariot in the late 1950s and early 16s. The nearly nuclear disaster caused by the Great Alaskan Earthquake in 1964 and the 1971 test of a warhead on the island of Kamchitka, which, well, cost us a few billion dollars. It's compact, it's expertly drawn. Talking about stuff you probably didn't learn in school, it does a good setup and it even, ref you know, it's, it's fully footnoted. And it also is a lot of it, especially from Project Chariot, 
was reported by a book called The Firecracker Boys, reported by Dan O'Neill. And I just ordered it off the Ebays because, you know, it's cheap. But this graphic novel is very eye-opening. Most of the time, oh, brain fart, there's a certain code word they use when there's a, a accident involving nuclear weapons. There's been a lot of them, folks. Some of them I've talked about, some of them I haven't. But you can read this book and it's, oh my gosh, eye-opening. And this is all stuff that's still played out today. And one of the places has been turned into a park, road trip. So I definitely recommend this Nuking Alaska. Kind of mini reviews, we haven't done it for a while. Did see Indiana Jones and in the whatever fifth movie, loved it. Well, okay, I didn't love it, I liked it, I enjoyed it. I listened to the blowback, I sit down and I'm like, Okay, this is a roller coaster movie. Just enjoy it for what it is. And it is. I even saw interviews, because I think the only talk show going on is uh what's his name over in England? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I brain fart on that. You you know, he's he's the guy who gets to serve drinks to everybody and keeps them all together on a couch. So they get to say fun things. But Harrison Ford was on a on an interview, one of those interview shows where he says he kind of likes the closer of the character, the fact that he is old, he is suffering from old people stuff, which if you remember a lot of my freakings, I am too. He enjoyed it. What I find amazing, and I, I get this idea from uh, Jason Matheson, he says, now wait a minute, Indiana Jones and the dial of whatever is considered a flop because it only rang up 80 million. However, a movie just came out this weekend, Mission Impossible. It did 80 million in its opening weekend and it's considered a success. He's like, Hollywood's kind of talking out of both sides of its yap, or the trade sheets are, because how can like, they both had the similar budget up into 300 millions, so they need to make God money in order to break even. But one makes 80 million and is a flop. The other one makes 80 million and is a success. Go figure. I say go see them both because they look incredible. Indiana Jones needs to be seen on the big screen. A lot of fun. And the reason I mentioned Mission Impossible because my friend again, Jeff from Cinema Judge, check it out, was showing me some of the clips of that. Does Tom Cruise got a death wish? That man has serious respect for me. Just the dedication and the practice and the learning of all the stunts he did, like flying, taking the plane off the, or no, he the big one they show, they show him riding the bike off a cliff and then diving. He did that like six, seven times before they committed it to film. And another one is, and I forget what they call it, it's like your speed parachuting with a, a direction shoot as you're flying over rocks. He did that himself. The dude does his own stunts. I have not seen a Mission Impossible movie. I'm going to go see this one because I got mad They're respect all good. for what They're all I know. Good. I have no doubt I will enjoy them. And I kick myself that I did not see him in the theater. And I definitely want to see this one in the theater. So definitely check it out. And as usual, I went geeking again. <laughs> so again, I had uh, flyers for Kelly's show coming up in July. Or is it August? I forget, there's so many shows coming up. The first place I stopped was Eau Claire Comic Con. I'm sorry, Eau Claire Comics, Claremont Comics in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Whew, a lot of C's there. I'm not good with alliteration. Uh, anyways, he is doing a sale on comics. It's either 15% off, I believe, or he gets tons of comics for a buck a piece. I was a bad boy. And I just picked up tons of comics. He's such, oh, Chris, duh, Chris does comics, get it? And he greeted me when he came in. I gave him flyers. I was telling him about Kelly's show that's coming up in August. I you know, mentioned the MCBA show. And just a wonderful guy. I just, I spent way too much money. I got a lot of fun stuff. Uh, I'm trying to find some of it now. 
Let's see. Uh, oh, here's my box. My box of stuff. Okay, I'm starting to sort stuff out for uh, the upcoming comic show. So I, I figured I'd divide it in things I'm keeping and reading, like the epic comic run of Run of Sisterhood of Steel. I got the Shogun Warriors run of. Oh, I'm sorry. This comes later. <laughs> I was a bad boy. Did I say I was a bad boy? But yes. you're talking like NFL Super Pros. I got a bunch of those Marvel tales, Iron Man, Avengers, Fantastic Four, things like that. Uh, Marvel Snapshots, a series called Hopeless Savages, which I've never read. Ascend the Avengers Celestial Quest, Steve Engelgard, George Santa Maria. Just a lot of fun stuff for a buck. DC Powers Celebration 1, Black History Month, The Last Avenger Story when it was all together, a uh, run of Revolutionary War, a run of Human Fly, some Death's Head, all sorts of fun things. His sale goes through the end of July, so if you get a chance to go there, tell him we sent you. Have some fun. Then I went down to Menominee into Heroes Welcome, and he had a bunch of stuff discounted as well. Um, I think I made his day because I think I dropped about 140 bucks there. <laughs> and it was a slow day. Uh, it was Wednesday, so, you know, free comic book day. So I imagine, or new comic book day. So I imagine people were in and out. We were there a couple of years ago, and it's a great store. It's got, you know, half games, half comics. A lot of books for 50 cents, a lot of books for a buck. And then I went through all the other stuff. So I had some fun. And then the last stop was at Can B Toys and Collectibles, our, our buddy Brian. And Kevin, Brian, of course, the founder of Hot Comics in Menominee, Wisconsin. And Brian was there. He's there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I was like, I come in and go, what a dump. And he's just laughing, you know. And of course, people in the store are like, who the hell is this guy? Picked up a bunch of stuff as well. You know, he's got stuff priced so well. I mean, I picked up a, like a, a Happy Days Um. He had some comic readers for like a buck ninety nine. Uh, I picked up a nice copy of the Parent Trap, the Walt Disney one. This is Ooh. Dell number twelve ten. I had seen a beat up copy, and who who's the who played the who played the Haley Mills? Oh, I was so in love with her as a kid. Everybody was in love with her. Oh. I, I and you know, there's got to be a, a a sequel out there somewhere where both those twins. Picked on a lucky comic store owner, ex comic store owner, and uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, my, I guess that's what the dark web's for. Anyways, now do you think I had enough? I, I did go to Source, of course, because I pick up new comics at the Source on every Wednesday, but that wasn't enough for me. So I'm in Menominee, Wisconsin, and I went all the way over to Moundsview, where my buddy Mark Myrtle who I talk about constantly because he's the guy who bought every single comic I had left at Hot Comics. Otherwise, to this day, they'd probably still be in my garage. And that was 20 years ago. But he picked up a collection of comics and he was just blowing them off for a buck because he was like, oh, I just don't have time to do this. I was stuck when the original sale hit at, the, at work, but I was dying looking at people digging through the stuff and the things they bought and just had an amazing time. And he, he contacted me and said, oh, sorry, you can't make it. I said, yeah, I got to work weekends. We come up Sunday. No, I work Sundays. He said, well, you want to come up Tuesday? I said, oh, get in touch with me. Contacted me Monday. And I'm like, Ugh, I'm going up. That's where I picked up a run of Sisterhood Steel, a run of Shogun Warriors, except number was one and two. Let's see, Batman... Conafee, the one that Kevin Smith and Walter Flanagan did, a bunch of Animal Mystic from Cirrus, a run of Death's Head, the Death's Head 2, I should say, some Bionic Woman, Sergio Argoni's Boogeyman, Nightmare Theater from Chaos, a bunch of NFL Super Pros. Yeah, I, I, I had some fun. I, I, I came home with a lot of books. And what I'm doing right now is going through as, as I get ready for the con and I trying to figure out how, what to do with these. So I figured figured out the ones I have duplicates of, things like Parent Trap I'm keeping. There's other ones I bought that I have duplicates of. Like I found I have a copy of Men in Black, number one, the first one from 
was it air cell? Is that what they called it? It was a Malibu imprint. The first, not, not the reprint. And you know, what's, what's not going to show up is going to bump up on the Ebays. So, or what I, what I'm not keeping or what I discover I duplicates of. Corey, you want to know the recent signed comics I picked up? Sure. I'm not talking about the ones that, uh, I've already, uh, talked about. Like, I, th I think I showed you, did I show you or showed you a picture? I picked up the, the, she Avshuns, Cerebus yes. in Hell number 75. Yeah, it's a naked yeah. cover that Dave Zim did. I also shared with you Night of the Living Dead, that actress Judith Ridley signed, which was very cool. I picked up a copy of Harley Quinn number 18 that was signed, only 93 signed by Ryan Sook. And I guess he did the cover. He did a, uh, after Bob Kane with Batman and... It's probably, I think it's a bat, the Batman is Robert Kane, and then the Harley Quinn is him. So they did kind of a, a homage cover. I uh, picked up Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, number one, that was signed, of course, by Elvira herself. And it's a photo cover. So I absolutely love that, just like the aforementioned one. And that's not enough, because the place I bought the Elvira, Mistress of the Dark's from, and if you... It's called Legacy Collectible Comics on eBay. They gave, they sent me an offer because I was watching it, which is another reason why it's good to watch books because anytime you watch books, especially mine, I'll probably send you an offer on it just to, because I'm trying to move this stuff. But he sent me an offer, a 20 buck discount. I was so excited. I bought it on my phone. They did not give me the discount. So I, I, e I emailed him and I said, hey, could you? And he goes, yeah, we'll do it once everything's cleared. They sent me the 20 bucks back. I'm so happy. I turned around and bought a Monsters number three from TV Comics that was signed by Butch Patrick. At the same time, Pat Priest also signed copies, but I didn't get the one she signed. Back to the Ebays. So I was feeling so good with that, that not only did I go to the comic book group on Facebook and buy a ton of signed books for four bucks a piece, I also bought a China number one from Chaos that Joni signed herself. Not through Chaos at the time, but one of those in appearance signings. So you have the certificate of authenticity and then a little card saying, this allows you to meet Joni for one free sign book. So uh, I wish I was in San Diego. I'd go nuts. I am watching, of course, though, the upcoming cons, because I mentioned before, and I, the last thing I'm going to mention before I sign off to Corey, September 9th at the Expo building at the Eau Claire Fairgrounds, there is going to be a Claire Comic Con and put on by Claremont Comics. So they gave me a bunch of flyers. I said I'd promote it on this here podcast. It's a ways away, but you got a chance to Mark it down, September 9th, 10 to 5. You might even have a decent chance of getting stuff because I work weekends and I can't go. <laughs> oh, the shame. <sighs> I think that's it. Corey, what you geeking on? I talked a little about Collusion on Saturday. Go out of your way to watch it. If you like wrestling in any way, shape, or form, we had a two out of three falls, FTR, Tag Team Champions versus Bullet Club Gold. Two out of three falls. It went 57 minutes. Not only is it one of the best wrestling matches I've ever seen in my life, the people uh, on the website that I write for who don't like AEW also said it was the best thing they've said <laughs> they've watched in a, in a long time. So it's not just me. Not just me. I have really kind of fallen down the rabbit hole of free computer games. There, I sent Joe one about trains. Every week, Ooh. the Epic Game Store, which is owned by Epic Games, gives away a free computer game. Then if you are an Amazon Prime member, they give away a whole big old bunch of computer games every week, every month. And it's random. It's not like it's okay every Thursday they give out games. It's like, okay, we're going to give out 12 games this month. When are you going to put them up? Well, whenever we get around to it. <laughs> and some of them are 
you know, they're older games, but they're really good games like Bal Baldur's Gate 1. And, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. All sorts of stuff. Older RPGs. Uh, and then Steam gives away games. It's like I remember when the uh, pandemic started, there were a bunch of computer uh, game manufacturers who gave out a whole bunch of free games and they've just never really stopped. I don't know how they're making money. I don't care. I like free stuff. I have also been digging through the books that I've been buying when we go on our cheap book buys, Joe. I am reading science fiction anthologies over in a big old, I got a big old grocery bag. I've just kind of put them all in a big old grocery bag and have them on top of comic boxes to the comic room so that when I finish one, I read the next one. I love these books. Some of them aren't really short stories. They're like 80 page stories. Some of them are short stories where they're more like 15, 20. I also picked up some of the old Alfred Hitchcock anthologies, which were I remember in high school just loving those. And now that I'm picking them up, it's okay, cool. I can see kind of where my love for crime fiction came from. But it's nice to have short stories. You know, I like a good novel. I like sitting down and investing in a novel. I like reading uh, long novels. But every so often, it's just nice to, you know what? I read this story. It's done in an hour or two. Cool little story. Very well written. Move on. I think anthologies are kind of a lost art because, well, fiction isn't doing all that great. But when you go to Barnes and Noble, I remember as a kid, there'd be all the, there'd always be anthologies on the book spinner rack or at yeah, Walden Books. Now, not so much. They don't put out many anthologies anymore. You got to really dig to find them. And usually they only put out like, oh, it's the best science fiction stories of the year. Any other uh, science fiction anthologies? Nope, you get one. That's enough. One every year. That's all. And you should Com be grateful. Uh, comic wise, I am all caught up on Knights of the Dinner Table. Love that comic. Oh, I, yeah, the I only just problem, the issue. The only problem I'm going to have now is it's what, quarterly? Yeah. That's three months wait between issues. Yes, it's going to be thicker. Yes, you're going to get more for your money. But man, that's going to be a long wait. I don't know how I dealt with uh, bi monthly comics when I was a kid. Because, and uh, Box Day showed up on Saturday. I did not have time to even open and go through it until today. Ooh, it's like Christmas. Uh, Defenders Volume 2, which is all of the Steve Gerber story. It's this entire Steve Gerber story. Oh, they even have the uh, 50s horror stories that the headman came from. Which is, yeah, I like that. Uh, they do also reprint the original Guardians of the Galaxy story in the back because it was the Defenders that actually brought back the Guardians of the Galaxy after they'd been created. They had one story and then they were just kind of gone. And then the other one is a reprint. The Marvel Zomnibus. The only Marvel zombie stories that aren't in there are the Deadpool ones because I guess there were too many when they did Deadpool Merc with a Mouth and they had the zombie uh, Deadpool head for ages and ages. But it's got, you know, the, the, the miniseries, the tie-ins, the prequel, the stuff in the Ultimate Universe. I am looking forward to just sitting down and reading that because I read it in fits and starts because it came out and there for a while it was, oh, it's coming out all the time. And then it was, okay, there hasn't been a miniseries for a while. And then it would tie in with stuff and it, nope, I want to sit and I want to read it all at once. So uh, looking forward to that this weekend on my day off. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for two hours. Good for you. And we always think, oh, there's no way we'll have enough for even nine minutes. Have enough. No pain happening. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most, Joe. You know, I I always talk about my health, but I, I didn't, I've never mentioned that when the surgeon was trying to, you know, sew up my incision, I said I wanted to do it myself. And you know what he said? 
Suit yourself. Uh, I live for that noise. All right, everybody. Have a great week. Hit my music. <laughs>